The possibility of life in outer space has captured the imagination of scientists for centuries. Their attention fixed on distant planets and galaxies. But one promising clue might be right here on Earth. A pocket of ancient water buried deep under Timmins, Ontario. Water that could tell us something about life on Mars. As Mark Carcassol discovered, that's just one of the many avenues scientists are following in their relentless search for life out there. In hundreds of billions of galaxies, Earth is the only known planet to have given life. But as we probe deep under the Earth and further into the cosmos, we're finding the elements for life, inching us closer to the discovery of an extraterrestrial existence, an existence that needs water. The Canadian Shield in Northern Ontario is old, really old, like billions of years old. There's a lot we don't understand about how life arose on this planet. And it's here that the search for life begins. Barbara Sherwood Lawler, I'm a professor at the University of Toronto in the Department of Earth Sciences. Five years ago, almost two and a half kilometers underground in a Timmins, Ontario mine, Barbara found the oldest water on Earth. This is it? This is it, yeah. Some of that rusty colored, thickish liquid is 2.6 billion years old. It's a little bit more viscous than tap water would be. Is it all right if I take a whiff? It definitely doesn't. Musty. Yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to describe. It smells like my old gym bag. Yeah. It might not smell refreshing, but it's what's inside that matters. What this discovery has found is that there are, in fact, waters deep within other parts of our planet, below the surface, in the rocks, that contain energy that can support life as well. It's more likely a form of very simple microbial life. Life that may seem insignificant, but if Barbara finds it, it opens up the possibility of life in similar environments, environments that could exist on Mars. If we can show that deep beneath the surface in rocks of a billion years in age, they have flowing waters with energy that can support life on this planet, then it's very plausible to think that on Mars, that that same kind of energy might exist as well. That's because Earth and Mars are not so different. Both planets have rocky surfaces, similar minerals, and are a sufficient distance from the sun. Earth and Mars are similar in age and geological composition. But so far, only Earth has shown life. So in both cases, it speaks to the habitability of both planets, the possibility that they might support life. That's why if Barbara finds life in the ancient water, there's hope for life outside our planet. Determining what kind of life can survive with what water could solve the mystery of how life comes to be. And no one is trying to figure that out harder than NASA, starting with Mars. NASA has invested a lot of time and uh, spacecraft in, in this question of whether life exists on Mars. I'm Ashwin Vasavada, and I'm the deputy project scientist for Curiosity. Because really, it's about whether we are alone. When you step back and think, what it would mean to discover that life took hold on anywhere besides Earth. It really is a profound question that keeps us uh, working day to day to answer it. It's a slow process, but the investment has started to pay off. NASA recently discovered that liquid water was present on Mars three billion years ago. In the distant past, there was rivers flowing and, and snow falling and maybe even rain. But liquid water is not life. Conditions have to be just right to sustain life the right energy and proper minerals. That's Curiosity's job, find these conditions. So this is the test model of Curiosity. Curiosity is the latest robot built by NASA to scour Mars for signs of life. Curiosity's mission has uh, been to search for any habitable environments that may have been present in early Mars and then assess if life ever took hold on Mars. To find out if life could have survived on the red planet, the multi-billion dollar behemoth would be outfitted with 17 cameras, two internal laboratories, a two meter extendable arm, and a laser used to drill deep into rocks. And she doesn't run on regular gasoline either. It's powered by a radioisotope thermoelectric generator. She's nuclear. She represents our curiosity. The search for life takes more than technology. It takes people and getting Curiosity to Mars would be no different. And lift off of the Atlas V with Curiosity. The whole act of going into space, of building robots and hurling them off to new places, is something that only exists because of our Curiosity. 
This man would be Curiosity's guardian on her journey to Mars. My name is Adam Steltzner, and I led the landing team for the Mars Curiosity rover. We didn't understand how hard it was going to be to bring such a big rover to the surface of Mars. Weighing almost a ton, Curiosity was five times bigger than her predecessors. We also can't test the landing system here on Earth, so pen and paper analysis, computer simulation, um, a lot of work. To reach Mars, Curiosity would travel 352 million miles at 5.9 kilometers a second for over eight months. Her speed and size made Adam's job a lot tougher. We couldn't use airbags because there's no fabric known to humankind strong enough to handle the loads that are developed when, when a rover the size of Curiosity is wrapped in airbags. Adam and his team came up with the Sky Crane, a risky plan to gently lower Curiosity onto Mars. Adam was confident. Because we had spent years thinking about what could kill us at Mars, writing down lists of the threats. But it's what he didn't know that worried him. It's something that we haven't thought to think of. I'm afraid of the thing I don't know to be afraid of. After 10 years of testing, designing, and more testing, Curiosity was scheduled to land August 5th, 2012. The event was live streamed, crowds gathered. Adam felt the pressure. We were sweating. We're all actually officially supposed to sit, but I could not sit. More than just a mission, Curiosity's landing represented innovation and pushing the limits. There were only two possible outcomes, success. I was rationally confident. Or failure but I was emotionally terrified. So it was tense, it really tense. You have to be stable. Then it came. Touchdown confirmed. We're safe. Touchdown. I was kind of stunned. I'm sitting there, it just happened. 10 years of your life, you've worked your tail off, um, you were worried about it, and it's done. With the landing getting the world's attention, Curiosity was under pressure to deliver. Over the last 18 months, that's less than one Martian year, Curiosity's been hard at work exploring the distant world, even snapping the obligatory rover selfie. She's been testing the soil, rocks, and atmosphere. Then, in December, after gathering all that evidence, NASA came to one conclusion. We have discovered a site on Mars where there was a standing body of fresh water uh, and other environmental conditions, the right chemicals that life requires. All these factors together paint a picture of a habitable place uh, in Gale Crater. Once upon a time, that site, Yellowknife Bay, was a habitable lake system that could have supported life for millions of years, looking something like this. Just a, a gorgeous place. It must have been a couple billion years ago. So, mission accomplished. Mars could have harbored life, getting us even closer to discovering if it exists outside our planet. I want to live in an inhabited universe. That feels warmer to me than the idea of being alone on this planet. Next, our pale blue dot isn't the only place where life exists. It could have happened and did happen a staggering number of times in the 13.7 billion year history of the universe. The insatiable quest, the thirst to know if life exists elsewhere, goes way, way beyond Mars. Nestled in the Rocky Mountains of Boulder, Colorado, this woman has a thing for Saturn. Everybody knows about Saturn because it's the most unusual looking planet we have, floating there with its rings. It's very supernatural looking. My name is Carolyn Porco and I'm a planetary scientist and I lead the imaging team on the Cassini mission at Saturn. Cassini is an unmanned spacecraft sent to photograph and explore Saturn and her 62 moons. It is the farthest orbiting man-made device in our solar system. The idea was we were going to equip it to the hilt to study all the various phenomena that can be found in the Saturnian system. A deep space detective, it took the Cassini orbiter seven years to reach Saturn in 2004. And over the last decade, Cassini's been offering some intriguing signs of life. Starting with Titan a murky, hazy, Earth-like moon with a fully developed atmosphere. So it becomes this thing of intense fascination to find out is, you know, what is beneath those clouds in the atmosphere and so on. 
Earlier images had indicated the appearance of shorelines, potential lakes filled with liquid. The imaging team saw something that we looked very much like a lake. Titan is the only place in our solar system other than Earth with liquid currently on its surface. So Cassini went in for a closer look. Other instruments verified that there was a big lake about the size of Lake Ontario. In fact, we called it Ontario Lacus. But there would be no life as we know it on Titan. That lake was full of liquid hydrocarbons like methane. But to Carolyn, there's still a lot Titan can teach us about life on Earth. Any native organic materials, original organic materials that were present on the Earth are long since gone because the oxygen in our atmosphere destroys them. So here we have a body where we can actually study organic processes. You could think of Titan as being like a primordial Earth. It's just a wondrous place, Titan is. And it's in our solar system. We can claim it. <laughs> there are three ingredients for life as we know it on Earth. Liquid water, energy such as heat, and organic materials like carbon. Carolyn turned her attention to another one of Saturn's moons, Enceladus, which has all three. What we found was this forest of jets erupting from the South Pole in what to me was the most dramatic discovery we'd ever made because it was obvious there was geological activity on the surface of another body in our solar system. A series of four fault lines along Enceladus's South Pole house 100 geysers spewing ice and water vapor into the darkness of space. No one had ever seen anything like it before. Then, last year, Scientists announced that the ice and vapor is coming from a hidden body of water. We now know that what we're seeing, these jets are geysers. They erupt from a sea of salty liquid water with organic materials in it built beneath this, the South Pole. It doesn't get much more exciting than this. That sea of water flowing under 40 kilometers of ice is mixing with organics and heat, meaning there could be life, finally. An answer might be within reach. If we found life on another planet, then I think that means the spell is broken. It means that life is not a bug, but a feature of the universe in which we live, and that it could have happened and did happen a staggering number of times in the 13.7 billion year history of the universe. We are for the first time able to place our solar system in the cosmic context. This man isn't looking for life on familiar planets. He's looking for alien worlds. My name is Ray Jayavordana. I'm a professor of astronomy at the University of Toronto. Three decades ago, scientists had charted eight planets, plus Pluto, in our solar system. Today, they're discovering thousands of planets circling other stars in other systems. These are planets beyond our own solar system. We're getting to know these distant alien worlds, many of which we can't even directly see. This February alone, 750 new planets were discovered in our own galaxy. Ray says that among these planets, Earth-like worlds must exist. In that they have, uh, they're similar in size to the Earth, and they may circle a star at about the right distance, so that in principle they could uh, sustain water, liquid water, on their surface. It's called the Goldilocks zone, when a planet orbits its star at just the right distance, not too hot and not too cold. In fact, the Kepler mission, a telescope launched into space in 2009, estimates tens of billions of planets could exist. In other words, the, the diversity of worlds out there is, is truly breathtaking. Because as other planets and systems are discovered, the chances of Earth and life being unique dwindle. Planets are incredibly common, but we've also learned that uh, ingredients for life is also rather common. If the ingredients of life are common, habitats are common, it stands to reason that life must have originated more than once. We search the cosmos to learn more about ourselves, asking if we are a cosmic accident, questioning Earth's specialness. Sometimes a picture answers those questions best. That's here, that's home, that's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know. Carl Sagan, the famed astronomer, called this image of the Earth deep in space the pale blue dot. He recorded this message to inspire. The Earth is the only world known so far to harbor life. He used it as a, um, a romantic allegory of the human condition. He used it as a call to planetary brotherhood and all the beautiful things he had to say about it. 
there is nowhere else, at least in the near future, to which our species could migrate. Carolyn updated the image last year with The Day the Earth Smiled, a high-res portrait of the Earth from Saturn, a visual tribute to just how far we've come in exploring life. Isn't this just a fabulous time to think about how unusual our planet is, how beautiful it is, how life-sustaining it is? Because as we scour planets and galaxies, our own lives come into focus. And to just revel in being alive on a pale blue dot of a planet. And so that's what we did. And I'm almost going to tear up here thinking about it. And that is our broadcast for tonight. I'm Carolyn Jarvis. From all of us here at 16 by 9, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week.